God can look into your future, know what you're going to need, and plan for your needs in the future now. So something that's happening to you now may not make sense now, but it'll make sense by and by. Praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. This is the Breath of Life television broadcast with Pastor Walter L. Pearson, Jr. When God gets ready, he can deliver you. If you call on him, if you trust in him, he's worthy of the Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Esther, chapter 6, and there you will find the words that will introduce us to our thought for tonight. Esther, chapter 6, and let me begin with verse 1. On that night could not the king sleep. And he commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles. And they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, there is nothing done for him. I've entitled our study, Overnight. Overnight. Let's bow together as we pray. Father in heaven, we come with empty cups. We come needing to know for a certainty that if God be for us, no one can be against us. And so we look to thy word and we trust that before we have left this place that our hearts shall be lifted and our courage shall have increased. We trust it because we know that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. So our cups are lifted high and we trust that they shall be filled to overflowing. In the name of Jesus, amen. This is one of the most striking stories in the Word of God. It begins with uh, what might be understood as an early revelation of gender equality. Uh, the fact is that King Xerxes, Ahasuerus, as he is called in this scripture, had called a banquet. He had called it for his nobles and for the greats in his kingdom. It would last, according to some scholars, for 180 days. Maybe not the same people for the whole time. Maybe some came and others came later. But this went on for a time that is almost unimaginable for us now. At the same time, there was, as part of this celebration, another wonderful gathering of women who came together with the queen Vashti. And as they feasted, one scholar suggests, they feasted only for lifting the name of the king. Now, you would think that a king would want to do more with his resources than that, but some people's egos need to be fed. Evidently, this King Xerxes was one of those people. And so he said, let's have a feast and let's honor me. Let's show everybody what I've got. Let's show them how powerful I am. Let's bring my friends and parade them in front of everybody. Let's show how much we have in this kingdom and let them see that I am above it all. And so they began with their feasting. And in the middle of it, it is apparent that 
they began to go into some activities that are contraindicated. They began to take vessels. Some would suggest vessels that were holy, but it is not too clear. In fact, I would not rest my reputation on it. But from whatever containers they chose, they apparently drank alcoholic beverages that robbed them of their wisdom. And when they were sufficiently drunk, they began to do things that were not wise. That is not a strange story, is it? Among those people who met, there were those who were impressed with what the king had. When you read this story and the colors that were there in the original language and how they are translated into to the King James Version, it seems like somebody is almost colorblind. But the fact is that the colors translate differently when you go and check them out. It appears that the Shushan Palace was a place of consummate beauty. Dark blue stone with gold and silver ornamentation. It had purple and white awnings and the furnishings matched the awnings and the other colors. They would drink not from normal glasses or containers, but each one was carved differently. You drank, in fact, from an objet d'art. And everyone was satisfied. So now, in the midst of their wonderful banquet, someone may have suggested, O oh, king, you have showed us everything else. We have heard of the beauty of the queen. Could it be that while the women are meeting there and we are meeting here, could it be that you would allow us to look upon the beauty of the queen? And as his wit had departed from him, he said, of course, I will cause her to come now. Now it appears that in that particular society, it was not appropriate for the women to come in public, certainly not for display as these would suggest to the king, but when you have buried your brain underneath a substance that ought not be there, it's no wonder what you will decide to do. And so he decides to make the call. He does it asking seven to go and fetch her, asking them publicly. I have learned in these years of marriage, and I now approach 30 years of marriage, I've learned that there are some things that are best discussed privately. It's amazing what you can accomplish with a private discussion. When the private discussion is over, you can come forth and declare many wonderful things. No one knows how they have been negotiated. It's not their business. But when you make private business public, you are flirting with disaster. Now, can you imagine seven messengers going now to the queen's residence and saying in some fashion that was not completely understandable to her, the king wishes for you to come now and show his friends your beauty. Now, I, I don't know, I don't want to judge everyone's experience by mine, but in the neighborhood where I grew up, we had certain ways of verbally punctuating tense situations. When something like that happened and everybody knew that something was called for in response, somebody might just say, hmm. <laughs> Can you imagine all those ladies gathered together having enjoyed the largesse of the queen and now an interruption comes? And the king sends seven people to say, come now. Queen Vashti is not disposed to answer so quickly. And so she may have said something like, I'll be there eventually. <laughs> now the ladies, mm -hmm. I guess he understands that. I would not go so far as to suggest that Queen Vashti may have snapped her fingers and said that. That would be too much, wouldn't it? But think about it, not a bad scenario. So now the plot thickens. The word goes back now to the king. 
if the king had been possessed of his senses, he would once again have said, come, whisper, tell me what happened. But you know, when uh, you're not thinking clearly, yeah, tell me, what happened? Where is the queen? Well, uh, your highness, could we come? No, no, these are my friends. Tell them what happened. <laughs> your highness, uh, the queen uh, is, how can I say this? not disposed to come just now. Now the guys talk. It, see, ladies, we talk about your little society all the time, and we make fun of it because it happens that more preachers are men than women. But let me let you in on some of our secrets. There is no place worse for gossip than a barber shop. <laughs> come on, brethren, let's get real. This is a time of equality now. And we have all kinds of mechanisms that we carry on in a barbershop. People say things that have no truth in them, whatever. There are people who come in and say, well, you know, I just want to tell you that every time I go home, my wife knows. I had better hear some pots making noise on the stove. My slippers ought to be at the door in my newspaper. Now, you follow a man like that home, and you will discover that the only last word that he has is yes, ma'am. Because a man who has wisdom would never say anything like that in public. That the way you stay married is to not discuss those things. Nobody's business. But men also react. Can you believe it? So now, you know, I can hear the brethren. Man, that's some serious stuff. You know, the king came back to queen car. Kind of rough. You know? He can command 127 provinces, but one woman he cannot command. <laughs> Perhaps he is not the leader we thought him to be. And the whispers grow louder and louder with those bass and baritone voices joining together. Now the king is disturbed. He says, you tell her I said come. And I, I don't read that there is more than one request, but... He begins now to talk with his legal department. Bring, bring the legal department here. I want to know what can be done because we cannot allow this to be. Listen to what they said way back there in the Persian Empire. They say, if the queen does not have to obey the king, what will happen in the regular little houses? If the queen can get away with this, what will the regular wives do when their husbands demand that something happen? Now that sounds out of place in 1990, whatever this might be. <laughs> but think about it. There is an influence. Uh, I, I was at home with an illness for a while, and I was condemned to watch talk shows. <laughs> I don't want to condemn everybody the same, and I'll be honest with you. There are one, and maybe in a stretch, two, that may have substance. All the rest... Sheer foolishness. People trying to out-talk each other and be louder than each other. And in fact, I heard a man talking on a payphone in an airport trying to convince some talk show department that he should be on the program, and he guaranteed them that he would tell all of his business. That's what they want. And I believe that talk shows, those that are not what they ought to be, have influenced conversation and and communication throughout society. So now we've got people who used to be kind and courteous speaking in ways that are completely out of character because now everybody thinks that's the way you ought to talk. Folk, let me tell you, no matter what you see on some talk show, keep your business to yourself. You know, don't get on. And some of the things that people do, if someone came to me and said, look, I want you to come on television, you're going to meet somebody who's going to surprise you. Oh, no, not on television. Now, me, if something's going to happen to me, I want to be way away in the corner somewhere so I, I can react without your seeing it. That's foolishness. Well, the, the, the public now is, is made aware of this, and, and they're right. If the queen can say no to the king, then some little lady has been trying to say that to her husband for the longest. I don't have to do what you say. <laughs> Who do you think you are? You're not my daddy. 
And if she hears about this, there will be a rough time in the little house tonight. So the legal department gets together. They said, here's what we can do. We can dispose of the queen. We can make it so that she will never come again to see you. In fact, we can declare her no longer queen and fill the spot with someone else. So Vashti is set aside. If you think that this is serendipity, that's a cute little word that means something that just happened. You are absolutely wrong. God watches over the affairs of those who claim his name. And since God knows the end from the beginning, God can look into your future, know what you're going to need, and plan for your needs in the future now. So something that's happening to you now may not make sense now, but it'll make sense by and by. So now what is God doing here? We have made our thesis clear. If God be for you, nobody can be against you. If God is for you, since God is not encapsulated in time, since God can extrapolate himself from time and walk into future or for that matter, go back in time. He is not a creature trapped by time. He created time. So now he can go into your future, determine what you need, plant things in your future by doing things in your present. That's why I serve God. In fact, you better be careful when you bother God's children because you may think you're getting away with it now, but God will let it slide now and put the punishment down there. So you are headed for a problem. What you sow, you'll reap. It's, it's God's command. So now, if you think that this change of queens is just something that happens, watch how it develops. Now the king says, bring all of the beautiful virgins. What do you do if you're a king and you want to get married? If you're a regular human being who wants to get married, there are any number of things that you can do. Most people just kind of look around, you know. <laughs> I read all that stuff too. Uh, go to the health spa. <laughs> Find somebody down there, some narcissistic human being worshiping his or her body but not paying any attention to their mind. So you end up with a well-muscled idiot. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have said that. Then you may find somebody whose body has, has, has maybe not been so developed, but they may have a sharp brain. Eventually, the brain will come in, into consonance with what's happening with the body. And if you've got the brain power, you can get it all in order. In fact, let me say something to you folk who are not married yet. Start looking for a brain. <laughs> I will give you the counsel that I give to my own children who are now technically beyond my reach, but I can still say things whether they hear me or not. I say to them that what you've got to do is maybe look for some of those strange looking folk. My, my daughter, I've said to her, look for you, a man whose clothes don't match. <laughs> but he's got a good brain. He's, he's in grad school. He's got a few degrees and he has a great future. You can go and buy him matching clothes. <laughs> oh, forgive me. I'm all in your business now, right? But you, you've got to be careful. You can't go by that. But if you're a king, you don't have to trust in what you read in these little journals on the way out of the checkout counter. You can just tell your folk, go and bring me everybody pretty you see. <laughs> you know, I want all of them. I said, but king, can't we leave any? No, don't leave anybody. Let the other people marry who's left. <laughs> and so now they bring everyone. They, they take first these women into a purification process so that if they've come from little tiny towns where they don't know the etiquette, you can't walk into the, into the palace, you know. 
You can't sit down at the king's table and not know which fork to use. You know? So they, they train them now, and then they make sure that their bodies are uh, up to stuff and that everything is in order. And it takes months, according to what I read. But finally, the women are ready to see the king. And when, when those who are in charge of the process come to this young lady by the name of Esther, star, it's translated. They say, what do you need? Do you need uh, to be kind of fixed up here? You know, there are preparations that can augment your appearance. <laughs> the thing that I hate most about doing this show is that I have to have stuff on me that keeps me from shining at you. <laughs> it disturbs me to no end, but I've got to do that for these lights that shine on me all night. And, and you know, I'm not accustomed to it. I'm itching right now. But I have a lot more patience now because I understand what you feel like under this foolishness. So they say, Esther, what would you like? She said, uh, nothing more than normal. You see, what you got to know is that beauty is not something that comes in a jar. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize to all the companies who make such things. But let me tell you that beauty is something that comes from within. A man may not be so handsome from without, but if his heart is inclined towards God and if his mind is set on Jesus, the man can look better every day. Lady may not be what you always dreamed of, but if her heart is inclined towards Jesus, if her mind is set on the things not of this earth but of heaven, it's amazing how beautiful she may become. Even though I'm watching out for my grandchildren, I've already told my children, if you have a choice between those whose minds and hearts are right and those whose bodies are beautiful, bring home the ones whose minds and hearts are right. I would rather have plain-looking grandchildren who are well-behaved <laughs> than pretty ones who are out of their mind. <laughs> so she says, don't bring me much. And now when this woman goes before the king, the beauty that God puts there shines out. And he said, uh, excuse me, excuse me, come on. The search is over. But king, we have uh, a line out there. Um, I said, the search is over. That one. But king, you, you haven't, did you, did you, did you hear what I said? <laughs> I have seen the queen. <laughs> if you're married, can you remember that moment? Oh, my. Something, isn't it? When you see the one. Ah, oh, warmth. That bathes you. The king has seen the one. And now Queen Esther is at the throne and you say how could it be that someone who is so high is brought low and someone who is so low is brought high but the Bible says that God set it up kings and takes them down God ultimately is in control so now you say well what was all of that about explain yourself preacher here comes there was a situation developing down at the Shushan Palace. At the gate of the city, a man had been elevated to higher power. Some people can deal with small jobs, but they can't handle too much. Haman, and you must never name your child Haman. No matter what the book says it means, you must never, never choose that name. Haman is elevated to great power. But Haman is a strange fellow, for when he rides first into the gate, everyone is supposed to bow down when he comes. When Haman, I would assume in some chariot, rides in, he looks around and perhaps didn't see on the first occasion that there was one who did not bow down. In fact, some commentators suggest that the crowd was too dense for him to see what had happened, but that somebody who wished 
either Mordecai harm or wished Haman trouble, came and told him. You don't have to tell everything. I've discovered that friends will not bring you extraneous bad news. Now, if, if someone says, I am planning to, to hurt Walter Pearson tonight, that would be the thing that you would want to tell me. <laughs> but if they say, I don't like the way he looks, there is nothing I can do about that. So why would you clutter my mind with that information? Are we together? So don't bring, you know, they don't like you. Who cares? That, that information clutters my brain. So I believe that people who love you don't bring you news like that. But one commentator says, well, you know how people are. Uh, somebody wanted to get in good with Haman. And there are some people who are purveyors of information. Oh, I wish I had time to talk about that. But, but they came. Uh, Haman, uh, Lord Haman, I uh, don't want to, you know, put a shadow on your day. But you may not have noticed that when you came in to the gate, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, everybody was bowing down, you know what I mean? But I happened to look, and I'm going to tell you something. That was one man, if he bowed, my name is not what it is. My man was standing straight up, looking at you like he was equal to you. Had a kind of an attitude. I'm serious. I'm just trying to tell you, you know, I don't say who said it, but I'm just trying to remember who told you. So uh, Haman should have said, who cares, you know, I got the job. <laughs> Folks, if, if you have a light, <laughs> there are many things that you can overlook, amen? You know, go about your business. Who cares if one person didn't bow down? Well, Haman said, uh, I'd like for someone to check and find out who it was who did not bow. And so someone goes out and in order to curry favor, builds a dossier on this man. Uh, here he is, Mordecai, age, let's see, background. Uh -huh. Comes from a different nation, different habits. Mm. That's interesting. Well, you know, they would have rolled it out like, okay, here it is. Let's prepare this document for Haman. Uh, Lord Haman, that information you asked for, sir, I have it presently. Would you like me to read it or would you like to read it at your leisure? I just want you to remember who did it for you, sir. There it is. And he reads now about this Mordecai. Now normally when you got an enemy, you pray for him and let him go. But if you are maniacally obsessed, then uh, we're going to have to do something about this. I tell you what, you watch him. I don't know what he looks like. Point him out to me when we ride in in the morning. So, uh, uh, your, your grace, look, look, over to the right. Yes, three o'clock. <laughs> See him over there? Standing as usual, we told you. Uh-huh, I see it. And, and it's true that he's different? Yes. Well, something has to be done. Now, now watch, folk. You may think that people are evil now. Haman determined that he would not only kill this man, but that he would commit genocide against all of the people who were like him. Something is wrong with thinking like that. And so he says, look, let's work up something. He's got people working on how we'll do it. In fact, go so far as to calculate what the revenues will be from taxes from this group of people and he puts it together and says let me take that now to Xerxes the king and tell him that I will pay what they would have given him for a certain number of years if he would give me the authority to wipe them out. Takes the king's signet ring and affixes it now to a document that gives him the authority to do it. So now he has this man where he wants him. And you would think that if Haman has such power, and if he's got a document with the king's signet on it, that the case is closed. 
But what you got to understand is that if God be for you, nobody can be against you. So what happens is this. The word goes out that the people who are called by God's name are about to be wiped from the earth. And let me tell you how, how diabolical this scheme is. The, the devil is angry with everyone who represents clearly the love of God on the earth. That's why they that live godly shall suffer persecution because Satan is angry at everyone who projects a clear picture of who God is. And I thank God that there are people who are still alive even in a time that seems mean. People who reflect the light of Christ in their everyday lives. People who go about trying to do good. People who want to be what God wants them to be. And you may not be liked by everybody, but who cares? Because if you stand up for what you know is right, if you rightly represent God, you will always get more than you lose. Because God is on your side. This plot was thicker than you could ever believe. It was a plot to take away a nation of people who were charged with sharing the, the information about the love of God. And if you think that God will stand by and let something like that happen, then you don't know God. Because actually, what God has already done is to take down one queen who could have cared less and put up another queen who, though they don't know it yet, is part of the same nation that is about to be annihilated. Do you see it happening? God can plan a plot better than any motion picture writer who ever lived. God is able to take stories and flip them over and turn them inside out. God is able to take facts that seem stacked against you and, and change the stacking so that those who are against you can't touch you. God is able to make a difference for those who love him. He's already put people in place. So now Mordecai finds himself with a dilemma, takes a message to Queen Esther and says, don't try to hide and not be one of the people now. <laughs> you, you, this is not the time to try and not be one of us. You know, there are some folk who will be with you when things are going well. But when times get rough, you know. Uh, are you a member of that church? Well, see, my parents go down there. <laughs> but, but really, you know, I just kind of go with them sometimes. You know, I, I, I don't really know. You know, I've been there sometimes. It's okay. But I'm not really con connected. But do you know her? Well, uh, why? Because, <laughs> you know, she gets on my nerves. Well, you know, I, I, I've met her. She's a casual acquaintance, but we're not that close, really. <laughs> if, if your friends are like that, you need some new friends. Yeah. What Mordecai is saying to his kinsman, Esther, don't try to slide by with us now. In fact, you may have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Maybe now you ought to use your power. In fact, I love what he says. He says, if you, if you deny us, then our deliverance will come from somewhere else. Because God will not let his children fail. If God be for you, nobody can be against you. If God can't use you to help us, Esther, he'll find somebody else. But you will be in trouble because you will have neglected to do what God put you there to do. Remember, folks, that wherever you are right this moment, God has a purpose for you where you are. You know, don't get excited. You get a new job. Don't just think of it as a job. It's an opportunity. You know, I love those jobs. I know people who have those jobs. You know the one I'm talking about. You got to go down to the building and and check with security. How you do? Uh, I'm Pearson and I want to see those of you. Well, sir, uh, do you have an appointment? Yes, I do. Uh, let me call. He looks about so okay. All right, okay. Sir, we're gonna have to check your identification. <laughs> okay. And you'll have to wait right here. We'll have to uh, check a couple of things and then you'll be able to be escorted up. <laughs> I love those jobs. I never had one. But I'm impressed. <laughs> and you get in an elevator and ride for a few minutes, you know, and end up in, in some beautifully carpeted corridor, and you go into an office where the desk 
is from sea to shining sea. <laughs> and where you talk in muffled tones and all of the colors match beautifully and beautiful little globes are around and beautiful people. You know the one I'm talking about. And when they beckon you to come, come. And you dare not speak loud in an office like that. But don't get excited because God put you there for a reason. And, and, and you can't forget the purpose. And, and what Mordecai is saying, don't, don't get excited now and try to pass for something that you're not. Remember that you are a child of God. And it's time for you to, to, to intercede for us. She sent a message back, Mordecai, get with the people and tell them to pray because I will stand for God. I'll put myself on the line. In fact, what she did was she broke the rule that was in the kingdom. They had a rule that nobody could go to see the king unless the king called you. And if you did, the king had a scepter always. If you came into the presence of the king without an invitation and he refused to put forth his scepter, you could lose your life. But if he put it forth and you came and touched the top of the scepter, then all was well. <laughs> when Esther comes in, the king's countenance must melt because her beauty is overwhelming. She is the light of his life. And she comes sheepishly in, and he, of course, puts it out and says, Dear, come, anything you want up to half of the kingdom. But she put herself on the line, and that's why God put her there. Are we together? Now watch what happens with this evil Haman. Haman gets invited to a little banquet with the king and queen alone because Esther is setting up her drama. <laughs> Haman is so excited, you know. <laughs> Goes home and tells his wife, <laughs> you'll never guess where I was today. You know, I, I've been all of my life looking for someone who would recognize who I am. You know that, dear, better than anyone. Well, I have just come from a banquet with the king and the queen and your husband alone. In fact, they're going to have another banquet. And I will be honored there. Sweetheart, what do you think? This is what we've been waiting for. I tell you, come, let me just hold you here. And Let's memorialize this moment. <laughs> but you know, listen, but you know, as happy as I am, I can't get that Mordecai off my mind. And you know, if I could get rid of him, I'd be really happy today. So his wife says, you got to be careful who you marry. <laughs> his wife says, you know what you ought to do to make yourself completely happy? <laughs> you ought to get rid of Mordecai in the same day that you meet with the king and queen. Then your life would be perfect. See, you know, that's not a bad idea. That's why I love you. <laughs> so Haman calls workmen and commissions them to build a hangman's noose in front of his door that stands high enough that all passers-by will see Mordecai hanging on this hangman's list. Wants it in front of his house so that he will be identified with it so that everybody will know, don't bother Haman. That's what happens when you get in his way. I, I see him talking to these workmen and telling them I want it built strong and high and I want it done quickly. And now, if you were to look at this picture as it is right now, you would say, toss out your theme, preacher, because we are about to see the man who stood up for God, the man who's on God's side. We are about to see him lose his life. But it boils down to one night. On the day that the workmen are finishing up the gallows, in fact, one commentator suggests 
And forgive me if I like the poignancy of the suggestion. One suggests that they didn't finish during the day and that perhaps they lit torches to finish their work into the night. But on that same night, the night that preceded the day that would bring Haman his full response to his plan, God decided to step in. And so God would not let the king sleep. The king could command 127 provinces, but he could not command one hour of sleep. And so the king says, call the, uh, call the readers and ask them to read from the records. Now, the, the, the uh, jury is still out on why. Some say he should have been asking them to read the Bible. Would have been better, wouldn't it? Some say he might have been better to talk about love and positive things. If you want to go to sleep, it's not great to, to fill your head with worries. But, but they come. The, the theory that I believe is closer to the facts is that he thought if they read that boring stuff, <laughs> you know, you take out a big thick book that you hate, and before long it will rest on your chest, and you'll be asleep. So he says, read. And they open up the... All right, uh, sir, where would you have us start? Oh, start anywhere. But God was leading them. And so they began to read. And on such and such a day, this happened. As a, the king says, oh, gosh, good. Read on, read on. And on another day, this is, and, and what happens? If, good, that's really good. <clears throat> and on that day, Big Thina and Tiresh were plotting to kill King Xerxes, but the plot was discovered by Mordecai, and Mordecai reported it to the king, and the king's life was spared. Hey, hey, hey. What'd you just say? Read, read that again. Oh, oh sir, this, this, you remember that, don't you? There was a plot to kill you, and, uh, and remember, Mordecai, I found about it, Mordecai came and told you, and that's how your life was spared. He said, wait a minute, I'll tell you what you do, read farther and find out what I did for him. Well, let's see, okay, uh, King, um, we're down a month now, and <laughs> sir, we, we, uh, we've done a year here, and you didn't do anything for it. What? Who is responsible for my calendar? Bring him. Well, sir, he, he's just, wake him up. You allowed me to let somebody who saved my life go without reward? I want something done about this now. I will not rest until I know what will happen. So that on the very night that Haman's gallows is finished, on the very night that a hangman's noose swings in the thick darkness of the Persian night. On the same night when the plot is laid and the noose hangs from a tall gallows. On that night, God would not let the king sleep. On that night, God reminded the king of a deed that a man had done and had not been rewarded for. And on that night, God moved on the heart of a king to reward a man for something that he had done long ago. Because God will not allow those who stand for him to be pushed down forever, but God knows how to step in on time. So in the morning, when the, when the gray of morning gives way to the pastels of the eastern horizon, there's something that's a stir. In the king's palace, no one is asleep. People are moving around way too early. And they have only one thing on their minds. What will we do? We've got to reward this man. And the, and the king, who has not slept through the night, is now energized strangely. He has only one thing on his mind, and that is, what will he do for somebody who saved his life? And all of a sudden, he hears the voice of someone who sounds familiar. It, it's, it's Haman, who's come early. Haman has come early 
to make sure that the papers are in order so he can hang Haman, hang Mordecai on the gallows in front of his door. He wants to get all the, the technicalities straight. So he came early. You got to be careful when you come too early if you're not on God's side. You may get something that you didn't bargain for. King says, who is that out there? He says, Haman, uh, Lord Haman, sir. Call him in. Lord Haman, come. Tell me, what should the king do for someone that he loves? <laughs> of course, Haman's mind goes immediately to himself. <laughs> oh, king. <laughs> oh, you don't know how glad I am that you asked me. I would take that robe that you love to wear. You know the one. I've remarked about it several times. I would put that on such a man. I would put him on your royal horse. But not before I had put all of the beautiful decorations on the animal. Then I would call for a cadre of hangers on and I would have heralds go before the horse and make the same declaration before this man that they make when you ride through town. So I would treat a man like that just like the king. Does that give you any ideas, sir? He said, yes, go and get Mordecai now and bring him here. Huh? This is not the answer that the man was looking for. And now, now, it may have been greater pain for Haman to see Mordecai put on a horse with the king's robe. Mordecai is not sh shaken up by it because when you don't seek fame and glory, fame and glory don't bother you. His life was not built around wearing the king's robe. His joy was not to ride the king's animal. He just wanted to please God. But it ate the heart out of Haman to have to walk along and watch somebody riding on his horse and wear the garment he should have worn. But the day wasn't over. Before that day was over, he went to that banquet, but it didn't play out like he planned because at that banquet, Esther told the king who it was who wanted to take her life and the life of her people. And when the king begged her, there he is. Can you imagine? <laughs> what are the thoughts? Haman's mind. But you got to think before you get there. My grandfather was not a great philosopher, but he would say all the time, if you dig a ditch, dig two. If you dig a ditch for somebody else, dig one for yourself. Because God is so intent on rewarding people who have evil minds that God will arrange it so. Now at the end of this day, in fact, at that very banquet, the king says, what? You would kill my queen and her people? But, but you, no, I don't want any explanation. The king walked out in his garden. While the king was out in his garden, Haman, his mind now is not touched with any substance. He's just out of his mind. <laughs> he goes to where Queen Esther has gone for a little respite and falls on the queen's bed to beg for mercy. And the king walks back in at the most inappropriate time and glimpses Haman. Do you see the picture? He called for those who were his executioners. They took a piece of cloth and laid it over Haman's face. The thought in that culture was that he no longer had the right to look upon the king and the king no longer had the desire to look upon him. 
so he must be treated as a dead man. And on that day, the king said, let Haman be taken to that gallows that I have witnessed throughout this day standing before his door and let him be hanged on the gallows that he built. God on your side means that your situation may change overnight. So whatever your problem is right now, whatever trouble seems to haunt you, whatever habit will not let you go, don't you ever take your hands out of God's hand. Because God has the ability to let a situation go on and on and on. But when the time is right for his glory, God will step in right on time. He can wait until the night before. But God can change things overnight. If God be for you, who can be against you? Outrageous. <laughs> Ever wonder if your life has meaning and purpose? If there was more to life than a sink full of suds? If God was really active in the details of your life? If there was greener grass over some other fence? If so, get this week's offer, Outrageous Grace by Dwight Nelson. Get the book and be prepared to jump for joy. Or at least get a case of happy toes. The grace from God is free. The book, it's a $5 donation. Grab a phone and make a free call. 877-BOL-OFFER. Translation, 877-265-6333. Or write for the book and let the U.S. Postal Service carry it to Breath of Life, P.O. Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. What else is there to say? Outrageous. I'm done. Let's just praise the Lord. If you'd like an audio cassette copy of today's program, call the number on your screen or write Walter Pearson, P.O. Box 97192, Washington, D.C., 20077. For your love gift of any amount, we'll send out your copy right away. And if you have a special prayer request, write us. Walter Pearson wants this ministry to be a blessing in your life. Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face. 